Welcome to Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate, the number one podcast dedicated to helping you get comfortable in the commercial real estate arena and equipping you with the latest market news, insights, and strategies you need to make informed decisions about investing. Now, let's get into today's episode with your host, Angel and Brittany Gonzalez and John Jerry. All right, everyone. Thank you for coming back to Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate. I'm your host, Angel Gonzalez. I'm with my co-host, Jen Gary and Brittany Gonzalez. And we are honored to have our special guest here, uh, Yona Wise here, who's going to give us an opportunity to get to know him and uh, get get to little know about his background and just a couple of his experiences. So uh, right off the bat, I'll just get us uh, kicked off here. And I'll ask you there, Yona, uh, can you please introduce yourself and describe what it is that you do? Sure. First of all, thank you so much. Uh, it's not every day that I get to be on a podcast with three hosts. I mean, uh, we were talking earlier, I'm pretty much on a podcast almost every day, but with three hosts, it's a different experience. And I love it because there's so much different input uh, that goes into it, different insights and questions come up. So appreciate you inviting me. And um, a little bit about myself. I am a real estate investor. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a father to six children. So that's, uh, you know, I definitely appreciate when there are babies involved in podcasts. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, I'm a real estate investor for the past eight years. My background before that was a teacher. So I spent about 15 years as a teacher at various levels. And really, it's been my passion for a long time. And the truth of the matter is, I continue to do that today in my expertise, which is cost segregation, which we are going to talk about. I'm sure I work for the biggest national company, Madison Specs, for um, you know doing cost segregation around the country, all types of asset classes. But I mean, that's that's really what I do. You know, I try to invest in real estate, raise capital, uh, invest in syndications, and uh, and do the cost seg all day. So. That's a little bit about me. Happy to dive into any specifics or more general things as well. Oh, that's fantastic, Yona. Well, we share a common interest. I was a, a former teacher myself, and so I, I definitely yeah. appreciated learning that about you. Um, so I'm just kind of curious a little bit more about your your experiences growing up. Is uh, Have you been around real estate your entire life, or is this something that's kind of new to you that you kind of found your way into? Yeah, I did not really have much experience with uh, with real estate growing up whatsoever. Uh, nor did I really have exposure to to business or finance or anything like that. You know, I I kind of went down the path as a teacher because you know I took history, you know, college as a major, and that my passion was you know teaching and and helping people, and so that's what I've been doing. I started a nonprofit to help you know widows and and orphans and people with uh, medical issues, you know, raising funds for them to help support and. I only stumbled across real estate. Really, actually, my first exposure to real estate was kind of indirectly. My parents, after I had already left the house, uh, you know, was married and had you know, my own kids already. I was, I'm the youngest of, of five, so uh, they decided to invest in some out-of-state single-family rentals, and so they bought, you know, over the course of several years, uh, I think four. Uh, single family rentals. And I got a little indirect exposure to them because every time I spoke to them, you know, it, it, it would come up in conversation sometimes. You know, so a tenant, you know, didn't pay. We had a pipe exploded, you know, all these kind of things. And I was like, oh, this doesn't sound like so funny. You're not even making any money on this. Like, why invest in real estate, uh, these single families? And my father had, uh, you know, his insight. It was, you know, it was, there was appreciation and he taught me about that. And the amortization also was, was something that, you know, he, he had, uh, had value in in that. So to me, that was my first really indirect exposure to that. Um, but when I I had a, a very I don't want to go too much into details, but a very uh, se- you know severe medical crisis in our family, our immediate family, about eight years ago, and it kind of threw me off my rails. You know, and I didn't know what to do. We got a, got into a tremendous amount more debt than besides you know just student debt that most people have, right? And I medical costs that I literally could not pay for, you know, tens of thousands of dollars that I didn't have. And uh, I was really at a crossroads in my life saying, you know, what should, I need to do something to figure something out to, you know, the teaching job was not going to cut it anymore. I wasn't, you know, not going to pay, make means and it ends me. But even just paying the, uh, that debt, I had no idea how we do it. So I reached out to a bunch of people, friends and, and you know, acquaintances just saying, Hey, I'm, I'm open to opportunities. I don't really want to go back to school for anything, but I want to, you know, find if there's another a second job or or some other industry, something I can do. 
And real estate kept coming up in conversation with, uh, with friends of mine. And it happened to be one day I met a friend of mine in the parking lot one day and happened to, you know, mention him. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm looking for a new job, looking for a new career, something because I need, I need money, right? <laughs> I need to, to pay these bills and I don't know what to do. And he said, uh, listen, why don't you come work for me? And I was like, okay, what do you, you know, I knew he was, he did something in real estate, but I didn't really know about it. And he explained he was a mortgage broker for many years. He also owned a bunch of uh, multifamily properties that he managed himself. And uh, he was ending uh, a stint by one big uh, mortgage firm that he was working for and was going off on his own. And he's like, hey, why don't you come work for me? And I'll basically show you the ropes of commercial real estate. I was like, Okay, I don't know anything. I remember our first conversation, you know, sat me down explaining like what's an LTV, you know, what's a cap rate, what are all these things? And I had no idea. So that was my real, you know, introduction to real estate. Uh, I sat with him for about eight, nine months in his office uh, almost every day of the week and literally just like apprenticed him. And this was, uh, you know, a friend of mine that I was, you know, friendly with, but we weren't like very extremely close friends. We became extremely close friends through throughout that time. And he basically, you know, taught me the ropes. He had been in real estate for, you know, 10 plus years and had really a lot of experience. And so I just gleaned from that. It was an incredible experience just learning from him. And so that was kind of the introduction to my, uh, my involvement in real estate. Wow. Quite the journey, man. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was fun. It was interesting. I would no, say th thank day. God. We, sorry, sorry. No, Brittany? go ahead. I, I say with all having a family, with having the children, making a change in career, it's definitely a lot that you took on and put on your plate. Um, what would you say would be something that you would say holds strong as like one of your um, biggest moments in your earlier career days that would make somebody want to take that jump over to do the same thing? It has. You have to really have the vision that you're not going to see results right away. Do not expect results. You know, real estate is really a long game and whatever you're in, whether you're in a brokerage or whether you're, you know, a realtor or you're doing uh, like I was doing at that time, you know, commercial mortgages, you don't see results right away. It takes time, you know, and you really just have to put in the reps, put it in and think of it like that. You know, when you're working out, it's, it's hard at the beginning, right? And you don't really see results. But if you keep it up every single day, Little by little, you will see results. And I learned, I, I kind of got introduced to um, Gary Vaynerchuk early on. And I don't know how, I just stumbled across him. I think it was on LinkedIn. And, and I, I came across like some, some talk of his and talked about a book. And I ended up reading a couple of his books. And he talks a lot about in marketing and in general, in marketing and sales, but he talks about the long game, right? He talks about, you know, you're, do things now, like you know, you're going to see results in five years, but just keep doing it and put, you know, keep putting in the the effort now. And and I really took that to heart. Man, I'm glad you took that to heart because I, I will tell you, I mean, uh, with someone like yourself, now, I, one of the things I definitely want to talk to our audience about is about your uh, your podcasting uh, ventures that you do. Can you tell me a little bit about why you jump into podcasts? Like, what what kind of intrigues you about the, this kind of forum that you've been so heavily involved in? Well, I love having conversations with people. You know, it's, it's great to have conversations. And as a teacher, I enjoy teaching the subject that I'm kind of an expert at. And so it's a way to sharpen the saw, if you will, right? Just keep, you keep sharing the same thing. You keep getting better at it. You keep explaining it in different ways. And I was really introduced to podcasting. Um, from LinkedIn. So that's a funny story because I, I got, I didn't know anything about social media, like nothing. You know, I was a teacher and I was not involved, didn't have any social media accounts whatsoever. I had a LinkedIn account because, you know, people had that. You had like your friends from college or whatever, and it was like a place to post a resume. But about six years ago or so, I, uh, I stumbled upon LinkedIn because fascinatingly enough, in sales, you're oftentimes you're Googling people's names. You're trying to figure out if this is the right person, the right address, et cetera. And so I kept Googling, you know, people's names. I'd have a lead and like, okay, is this the right person? Is this right, you know, phone number. And LinkedIn would kept coming up on the top search results in Google when you when you Google a person's name. And I highly recommend it. If you have a Google account, I, I uh, not a Google account. If you have a LinkedIn account, I guarantee you, unless you have an extremely common name, if you write your name into Google. Uh, one of the first results, if not the top result, will be LinkedIn, which is which is incredible. Which is very interesting because it's owned by Microsoft, so I don't know how that you know how that works. But um, 
but that was fascinating to me. So I, I really stumbled upon it and I started finding people on there and I just saw people posting original content. You changed at that time around six years ago from people, you know, just a place that was resumes and articles and stuff to people actually sharing original content, you know, videos and, and posts and not just long form articles, but short form content. And that fascinated me. And I was like, hmm, you know, maybe I should try this out. And I, I started posting, you know, things. And through that, you know, a month or two into it, someone reached out to me. I was like, hey, would you like to be a guest on my podcast to to talk about cost segregation, which you know you talk a lot about on LinkedIn? I was sharing a lot of content around it. And I was like, what's a podcast? You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and uh, and I ended up doing that. Uh, it was actually Adam Adams from the Creative Real Estate Podcast. He no longer runs that, but he's an amazing podcaster himself. And uh, from that, I literally one led to the next, and I got invited on another, another, another. And I, I was using social media to share that experience, that journey. Like I you know, post a screenshot, like, hey, I was just on this podcast with this host. It was great. Check it out. Etc. And through that, it just led to more things. And because of that kind of niche expertise that I had and developed, it's one of those things that if you have a podcast and you're looking for experts in their respective fields, you want to bring someone on who can talk about anything and everything that they're, you know, so it's a variety of, of guests. So I enjoyed it. I kept doing it. And at a certain point, about three and a half years ago, I started my own podcast, Voice Advice, as well, where I interview, um, People, mostly clients of mine, but but people who are you know, very successful real estate investors, and it's just a great form of uh, of media of conversation. And again, another thing, filming from Gary Vaynerchuk, when you record a long form content like this, mm-hmm. you can split it up into literally like a hundred pieces of smaller content. So it's really a content generating machine. Uh, having a podcast, you took a lot more away from that. Even the marketing tips of uh, continuing to expand. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> There's so much. It's so much more. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the insight that you make, and, I, and I've heard you make that comment before with the, the Google algorithm pulling up the LinkedIn profiles. I never really caught on to that until you really pointed that out. But it's it's a really interesting thing that, you know, you don't see that really with Facebook or any other platforms. It's always no. LinkedIn. So great observation. So, you know, I'm curious, you know, you're, you're highly active on social media. You know, you've got your cross seg business now. Are you still actively involved as a real estate investor as well? Do you have time to keep up all that? I am more passively than uh, than anything. I I chose kind of that path because because of what I do and I enjoy what I do. I don't want to be too involved heavily on the, the operating side. I tried it out a little bit and realized I'm not very good at underwriting. I'm not very good at asset management. I'm not very good at like dealing with vendors and and all that stuff. And certainly not contractors. And I actually did. Uh, about uh, four fix and flips at a certain point. This was before I started the cost seg, uh business, but I, I hated it. <laughs> and, and I did it with a partner and I, I hated it. So I found what I enjoy doing and I just try to focus on that. So yes, I continue investing in real estate, but at this point, mostly as a limited partner, I have raised capital as a general partner as well on a few deals. Uh, and we'll continue to do that with, with the right opportunities, with the right partners, with the right uh, operators. But generally speaking, uh, you know, I just try to invest passively. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And it's definitely a journey taking it from the operator side to just being able to be a passive investor. So you get to learn and hopefully the people that are teaching you, you know what they're doing. So that's a good way to look at it as well. A question I have for you is, have you had any mentors along the way? And would you be able to elaborate on those relationships for us? Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone needs to have mentors. And I think the, the fellow that I discussed earlier was probably the first mentor in terms of the, the beginning of my foray into real estate. Uh, David, he was amazing. You know, like I said, I sat with him for eight, nine months in his office and I continue to, you know, to talk with him almost, almost weekly uh, to this day. And he's been an incredible mentor to me. And he's continued to grow and do many other things. He ended up opening his own mortgage company and then he'll end up. You're doing a lot of things. Anyways, I've had several mentors. Uh, he is one that stood out to me. Another one that really stood out to me was a uh, someone who we met kind of, you know, again, in a different context. I didn't even know he was in real estate and ended up just ha- came up in conversation. And when I started getting into real estate, I had reached out to him. Actually, funny enough, um, when I was presented this opportunity to work for Madison Specs, this uh, the cost segregation company, I wasn't sure about it. I asked some people and I asked this mentor. And, uh, 
he was like, oh yeah, Mad at Specs, we use them for our class segregation all the time. They're great. <laughs> you know, he's like, they're good people. You should definitely work for them. Um, so but he was someone who has been in, you know, 30, now at this point, probably all close to 40 years in real estate as a developer. First, he started off as a broker, but then as a developer of industrial, of logistic property. So he's like very, very high level, uh, you know, was the president of, of NIOP, which is a big industrial, uh, uh, organization out there and has been just an incredible mentor to me to see someone like him who he's very big into philanthropy as well, which I'm, I'm very big into. And so he even puts on his website, you know, a page on his website about all the organizations that, you know, he donates to and the importance of philanthropy. And so that's something that, you know, was like stood out to me. Wow. This is someone that I can really learn a lot from because my goal, like I don't have a lot of goals per se, but one of my biggest goal, if I have any is, um, how much I can give, you know, how much money I can give away to charity and to help other people. Because like I said earlier, like I, I had experiences in my past where I've struggled and I know what that's like. And I had crises where you know, I just couldn't make ends meet. I had some people help me at that time. And I knew and I started an organization for people in similar situations. So I know what that's like. So I want to like pay it forward and, and, you know, give that back as much as possible. Wow, man. I, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you, man, the more you, I get to hear a little bit about you, I, I, I'm more intrigued and I got more questions that keep coming up in my head. Um, but the one that really kind of, uh, hit me was the fact that I've heard you associated with the phrase, your network is your network. And, uh, and I would like you to elaborate a little bit about that and what that means to you. Sure. Yeah. I actually say that as an introduction to my podcast every, uh, every day. Well, it's, it's pre-recorded, but it's the intro to every episode. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because people have different opinions of what that means. And some people think, Oh, it's, it's a farce. You know, your network's not your net worth. Like you have to have money in the bank, you know, and, and assets. That's your net worth, right? But in the truth of the matter is, if you expand your network, if you, um, really just connect with people and on a real level, right? Like conversations like we're having now, we're getting to know each other. Well, you're getting to know me a little better. Hopefully I'll get to know you guys as well. But, mm-hmm. The more you do that, the more those relationships build and the more opportunities can come from that. Now, that doesn't necessarily translate. You may not see that as dollars and cents right now, but I guarantee you, it, you put in, it's like a seed, you know, a seed investment. You're putting in those, uh, those efforts and you'll see it will sprout later on. I, uh, just a, a prime example of this. I try to go out of my way to make introductions and make connections between people. All the time, right? So I'll I'll go and say, oh, you have a podcast. Hey, I'd love to I'll show you some other people. They'll be great guests on your podcast. Or you know, I know someone's looking for a capital. You know, try to make that. A friend yesterday who reached out to me is like, yeah, we're looking for an associate for underwriting in our firm for acquisitions. Can you help me out? I put a post out there, and and like thirty people reached out to him. So you know, it's just making those connections, helping people, not trying to get anything out of it, but really just paying it forward. And there's a book called The Go Giver. By Bob Berg. It's an incredible book. He has a shaking head. Obviously, you've read it. It's, it's an incredible book. And the principle there for the listeners who may not have, uh, be familiar with this concept of being a go giver is just altruistically doing for others without expecting anything in return. And you will see how your life will change drastically because of that. Not only you'll become a more positive, a more, uh, you know, a good person, I think personally, but you'll also, it will, you know, instill that among all the people around you and just make it more abundance mindset um, type environment, which will create more opportunities. So the more people that you're around and the, the higher value of the quality of those people that you surround yourself with, and the more you do it on a daily basis, that just grows exponentially your, your network. And I mean, literally, you know, I have t- tens of thousands of, of followers and connections on social media, everything, but I try truly to actually have conversations with as many people as possible. It's not just like having that follower account and that's it. It's really about, you know, how can I add value to you and how can we, you know, how, how can we help each other? So that's to me what it means. And I think it translates in when opportunities come up, you'll see things happen. Uh, you know, someone will introduce, you know, a deal comes your way. Like I would have never heard about that deal had I not been connected with that person. And so I've had people who have, you know, closed deals, you know, tens of millions of dollars of deals just from that, that network. And you'll say, Oh, that's, you know, it, it just happened to be that way. No, it's, it's putting that effort in making those connections and making those, uh, valuable relationships. And through that comes, comes, uh, you know, business comes out of that. And that's what it means. Network is your net worth. 
Well, I love that concept. And, you know, I got to admit, you know, I, I kind of came across you naturally, uh, just kind of organically, you know, uh, probably on LinkedIn first, if I'm not mistaken. And I think more recently, I think I started following you on Twitter. And I know you've grown your online presence on both of those platforms. Where do you find yourself spending most of your time uh, in the online world these days? Uh, a little bit of everything. I'd say I, you know, I'm, I'm on a lot of those platforms, you know, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook a little bit as well. LinkedIn is still my biggest. Uh, I'm also, you know, bigger pockets also I try to check into the forums there. I get, you know, notifications come up all the time with cost segregation. So I'll, I'll pop in there from time to time. But I'd say the, the majority of the time is still in LinkedIn. I, I find it to be a much more positive in general, you know, and kind of business focused place uh, and networking for and I think it's like it's like a networking event you know a 24/7 networking event and so you can really make incredibly valuable connections and you're going back to what we were talking about before at the marketing all that it's an incredible way if you are sharing original content and providing value it's a great way to grow your brand and your business and people just get to know you and they totally just recognize you your name your face and they align it with whatever it is that niche that you are in. And so it becomes just natural. People think of you and they automatically connect that with what you do. And so I don't think that's as prevalent on, uh, on the other platforms as much. It might be, but again, people are on LinkedIn, like kind of with that business mindset. So it's a great way to kind of grow those business connections that way. I, I am learning. I say so much just because you think little things can be simple. But it's definitely something that makes such an impact on your business and your in your individual worth as well as your career. Um, would you have any other networking advice or tips that you would like to share with our audience that would help them kind of expand what it is? I'd say you know always think with the in mind to add value first, add value first, and uh, you know don't even think about getting anything in return, right? But it, it's a lot of discouraging for a lot of people who are not familiar or not active on social media to think, oh, how, why would I post something, put myself out there, and it's uncomfortable, and people are going to judge me. And there's so many excuses that we can come up with. But in the end of the day, no, we all have this. We all have that kind of imposter syndrome also. You have so much worth, every single one of us. And we have so much value and so much to share that other people may know. And even if you're just a tiny bit ahead of someone else in your career or in whatever you're doing, that value between where you were and where you are now, there's other people out there that want to get there to where you are now. I mean, think about it. Think about where you were five years ago or two years ago. And think about what you know now. If you could have learned that you know, five years ago, think about how, how massive value that would be. So that's kind of the idea that I have. You can, you can always affect one person. you know, And you never know who that person is going to be. And it can actually change someone's life. And so going out there, going out of your comfort zone to post original content, even if it gets like, you know, like six views, you know, and like one like, you never know who that one person who liked that can literally change their life. Um, so, you know, just, just put it out there and, uh, and be confident that, uh, that there will be value if you provide value. Wow, I I I gotta tell you, I, I already know that you've given us a book, and I and I can imagine that there's a lot of things that you could share with our audience. But for me, from a standpoint, especially being an educator that you are, is there like a a book or a movie or something that you connect with that you believe that um, some of us should kind of dig into to kind of help our journeys along as well? I mean, there's so many. You should read a lot of books. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a big I'm a big fan of of books. Oh, yeah? And the funny thing is, I have uh, on on my podcast, I also ask. Ask people a little bit of a different question, like what's a book that's giving you a paradigm shift? You know, because I want to see like how's something that's really changed your life or changed your way of thinking. And having you know, in my own podcast, over 360 episodes in, I have a big reading list. You know, so I haven't gotten to all of them, but I definitely try to read as much as I can. One that uh, one that's really affected me uh, more recently is, and you may have heard of it as well. You may actually have it on your bookshelf behind you. That I can't really see the small print, but um, is who, not how. By by Dan Sullivan uh, and um, I forget and Ben uh, I forget who the the co author the real author is but Ben uh, someone or other anyways I don't have it on my shelf here it's at home the the who who not how is was totally a game changer a paradigm shift of how to focus your energies in doing the things that you're good at and doing the things that you love doing and finding other people to do everything else. And realize your, you know, realizing your worth and the value of your own time and hiring other people 
uh, and building a team, other people to take care of everything actually grows exponentially how much you can actually grow. And so there's a lot of people, especially when you're starting out in business or real estate investing, you think you have to do everything yourself. You know, and we, we all, we all have that and all entrepreneurs, we have that, right? Yeah. We're all guilty of that. And the truth of the matter is the more you hand off and, and give up, you know, the, the idea that I have to do everything or I have to oversee it at least and give that up and let other people do it, the more it frees up your time to do the more important than them or the higher money making, you know, things that can actually grow your business, uh, even more. So that's a huge, huge book. I would say that, uh, hopefully. Will help some people. Well, Yona, um, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm a former CPA and uh, spent a season doing taxes. And I'm ashamed to admit that. I'm, I'm sorry. Really sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit that I was not familiar with the concept of cost segregation. So, uh, would you mind spending a little time just going a little bit deeper on that and kind of explaining to our audience what it is and on a broad sense and uh, what it is that you do? Absolutely. You're not alone. Uh, believe it or not, there are. <laughs> I used to give uh, CPE, you know, webinars for which is continued uh, learning credits for someone to keep their CPA license, right? You're required to take these, you know, and ed- continued education. And I used to give them to to hundreds of accountants, uh, CPAs at the time. Every every webinar, and I'd ask the poll question like, "What your you know level of familiarity is with segregation?" And invariably, literally. I, I looked at the polls afterwards and what, there were thousands of CPAs over the time that I gave these webinars. 70 to 80% of the CPAs either had no idea what it was or had heard the name, but had no, you know, no familiarity with it. So we're talking CPA. So conservation is a tax strategy. Uh, and so you would think every CPA should know this, but it's a niche area of the tax code. Unless you are familiar with real estate. You, you just may not be dealing with it. So it's fair to assume, you know, CPAs don't have to know every kind of niche area of the tax code. Um, and just to explain what it is, we have to understand what depreciation is because depreciation is a tax deduction and cost segregation is just an advanced form of that depreciation deduction. And what depreciation is, it's not what it sounds like. It sounds like, you know, my property is going down in value. I don't really want that. I want my property to go up in value. Why would I want anything to do with depreciation? No, it's just the name of a deduction. It's a borrowed term. So you got to get that straight first. It's a borrowed term uh, based on the principle that things go down in value. When you buy a property besides for your primary residence, you're literally able to take a tax write off of the value as if it's going down in value, right? So that's what's called the depreciation deduction. And this, it's not intrinsic to the property because it's based on your purchase price, for the time you buy it. And you're able to write it off over a 27 and a half year period if it's a residential, including multifamily property, or over a 39 year period if it's a commercial property. And so that's what depreciation deduction is. It's a little bit, again, think about it like it's about a two to three percent, uh, deduction of your property value every single year. Okay. That's in a nutshell. And it's great on its own. That's awesome. I mean, depreciation. Can be extremely beneficial. You know, it helps reduce your tax liability just because you bought a property. Now, cost segregation, I said, is an advanced form of that. And essentially, it says the tax code actually says that there are components within a property that depreciate on faster schedules than that 27 and a half or 39 year. And so the process of cost segregation is identifying through an engineering report of a property, identifying what those components are that depreciate faster on a five, excuse me, or seven. Or 15 year schedule and then compiling a big, you know, report and list of those and values of that and essentially taking a lump, a, a larger amount of those or, you know, sorry, not a larger amount, but uh, a large amount of those deductions in the earlier years of ownership. So kind of to put it, put it in perspective. So we understand what we're talking about here. Say you buy a property for a million dollars. Okay. You take out a certain amount for land. Land does not appreciate, but the building improvements do. Now, instead of taking it on a 27 and a half year and saying you get about $30,000 deduction every year, how do I get that number? Take a million dollars, take off a little bit for land, divide it by 27 and a half, you get about $30,000. That's just simple math here, guys. Um, not, not doing anything too complicated. And if you don't trust me, you can do the math on your own. But simply put, $30,000 deduction is awesome. Okay, you get to literally write that off. What conservation says is about 20% sometimes or 30% of a property is actually in the five year or 15 year property. Which means you can take, you know, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars in the first few years of ownership uh, of deductions instead of thirty thousand dollars a year. You literally front loading a larger chunk of that, and so it's really the time value of money 
is by pulling forward some of those deductions that you may never see, and you may never even use. Um, and, and using those deductions now to reduce your tax liability, use that as a cash flow to, to reinvest. And so to break it down a little further, just to understand what's five-year property, what's 15-year property, think of it like this. Anything that's non-structural is going to depreciate on these faster schedules. So interior, inside a property, you have like furniture, appliances, fixtures, even cabinets or shelving, countertops, window treatments, flooring. Also, all that's considered five-year property, meaning it depreciates on a five-year schedule according to the IRS. And just to clarify, we're not saying that it's actually going down in value. And again, this resets every time the property changes hands and based on the new purchase price. So it's not intrinsic to it. And yes, even though you may need to replace you know, the flooring or the cabinets every five years or, or 10 years, whatever it is, that's irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, the tax deduction is saying there is a value to this, regardless if there is really a value to it, which is the crazy thing, right? You, you could buy a property for a million dollars and the appraised value could be $10 million, right? But you bought it at a huge discount. Guess what? The IRS says you paid a million, you can only depreciate a million dollars, right? Mm-hmm. But the opposite is true. If you buy something for $10 million and it's really appraised value is only a million dollars, you can write off the $10 million, right? So again, it's, it goes both ways. And so there's a, there's a benefit uh, with regards to that either way. You, look at it. you know, I, I know that uh, Rudy was going to ask a question, but I have a question before she does now leading into that. And that is the fact that when do you think it's best for someone to take advantage of it or, or what's the process of, hey, what should, when should, what should I do next in order to take advantage of this? It's really it's subjective. I think it could work best for, for different people at different times. And depending on when you need those deductions the most, that's really when it's going to be most beneficial. Now, you can get it done at any time. Um, we always, the process, we always like to run a free upfront analysis of any property so you can see what the potential tax savings would be before you even start. And so a lot of people like to get that even when they're under contract on a property, especially if they're raising money. It's a good thing to kind of show investors what the potential you know, write-off is going to be, whether it's depreciation. And, and you'll see this on decks. You know, people put in 100% bonus depreciation or now it's 80% bonus depreciation. And we'll get to that. We can talk about that if you want. Um, but it can be done at any point, meaning if you've owned a property for a number of years and, and never did cost seg, you just took straight line regular depreciation. You can go back and do a cost seg now and catch up that, those missed depreciation deductions. So it can be done. And sometimes it's actually more beneficial, like I said, to do it at a later date, not necessarily in the first year, because maybe you don't have any real tax liability in the first year. Oftentimes you might have a property and really setting it up in the first year, um, depending on when you buy it, you may not have revenue from the property. So you may not need those extra deductions. Maybe in the next year, you're, you're planning on having a bigger capital expense, a big old capital event, or maybe you're, you're selling a property and going to have a big gain. You can use the losses from the cost sake to offset that gain. So maybe it's you know worthwhile to wait to do it at that point and use it as a strategy. You know, it's not necessarily something you need to do every single year, you know, every property you buy. It's uh like I said, when it's most beneficial, that's when you can employ it. It's nice to have that optionality. I love that. For sure. I, I when you did talk about the bonus, uh one of the things that you mentioned there, I, I actually got to tell you, I actually got lost there for a second. So I'm wondering, can you elaborate on that for me? Because I have no idea how I could present that or set that up for our side of things. Yeah, bonus depreciation. So we, we talked about cost segregation. Once you've done a cost segregation study and allocated certain components, certain property to five-year schedule, 15-year schedule, those accelerated deductions, you can either spread out over those respective periods. So again, you're going to, in the first five years, you're going to get a lot more, you know, double or triple the deductions that you would have normally. Or you have the option, which is called bonus depreciation. Now, this was introduced as a law back in 2017 with the tax reform. It actually changed uh, an existing law, but without getting too too much into the details, it introduced something called 100% bonus depreciation, which says you have the option, once you've done a cost sake study, to take those accelerated deductions, 100% of them in the first year upfront. So like we mentioned, you say buy a million dollar property, you take, you know, 20% of that as accelerated deductions, $200,000. Instead of spreading that over a five year period, you can actually now take that as a lump sum in the first year. So a big $200,000 deduction. That, uh, was in the books and in, in the, uh, the tax code to, 
continue for until 2022. And so at the end of 2022, it ended 100% bonus is now phasing out by 20% each year. So this year in 2023, it's 80% bonus, which means you can take 80% of those accelerated deductions in the first year, which is still great. And the remaining 20% can still be spread over those respective five, 15-year accelerated schedules. And again, what we're doing with Cossack, we're not taking all of the deductions up front. You're still left with the remaining, you know, building and structural components like the roof, the walls, doors, windows, you know, foundation, all that's considered structural depreciating on that 27 and a half year schedule. So you're still going to have, right, every year, even after the first year, if you take a lump sum, you're still going to have the majority of 70, 80% of those deductions as an equal deduction, uh, equal amount every single year. So you're not left, a lot of people think, oh, I'm taking all the depreciation up front. I'm not left with anything next year. No, you're still left with, you know, the remainder that you can take as uh, an equal amount every single year. Oh, thanks for elaborating on that. <laughs> yeah, that was very insightful. And I think it's very beneficial to not only our listeners, but just to even to us. It's really great to Absolutely. hear explain that. So thank you. I'm going to kind of switch um, theories, I'd say, or um, questions as the direction I'm going. Um, but our company's motto is faith, family, and giving. Um, you actually mentioned um, giving is very important to you, as well as you talked a little bit at the beginning with family of the children. Um, but you can even expand more about like the organization that you have or just on how do one of these impact you the most in your life? I think the all three impact me on a daily basis. You know, faith, family, giving. I, I love that motto. That's really amazing. Um, and the... I'm, I'm a very religious, very spiritual person. And so on a daily basis, you know, I'm very, very connected to all those things. So it's kind of hard for me to describe, you know, how those things affect me. But I think realizing that, you know, we're here in this world for a very limited period of time. And so the effect that we can have on others. And, and obviously that took me a while. You know, I have a lot of gray hairs here in my beard. I don't know if you can see that, but it took me a while and six kids and at this point, three teenagers, you know, to, to get all those, you know, my father used to say, like, I earned all these, you know, grays, <laughs> grays, you know, <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's something that really uh, has a very profound effect on me, you know, thinking about on a daily basis, what I can do to maximize every single day, because we're here for a limited amount of time. We don't know how, how much time that is going to be. You know, some people, Live for a hundred years. Some people live for you know fifty. Some and and you don't know when that day is going to come. So realizing how can I do the best today? How can I give back today? And uh, a friend of mine came up with this acronym: Hope. Help one person every day. I love that acronym. So I keep saying it over and over. And that's just how can I go out of my way to make effect on one other person? And it's not a lot. Now you can affect. You can do it, and you can. Do it 10 people or 100 people, whatever you want. But if you think about it, it's not a lot to just help one person or do something for someone else, you know, one person every day. And if you think about it, over the years, that compounds. That's, that's thousands of people you're really affecting and helping. And uh, all it takes is one little small effort. So if you go out of your way every single day to try to make the day the best you can, and even start small, just like one little thing, you'll end up growing and, and doing a lot more than that. I. I appreciate you sharing that. That hits home to me very much. Um, as an angel knows and probably has heard this, but um, that's definitely something my dad always told me. Like his big thing is that like he literally lives by that. He's like, all I need to do is make sure I make one, I do one good deed for somebody else today. That's his big saying. And so it's really cool to hear your perspective. And I appreciate you sharing that. So thank you. And by the way, Yon, I should tell you that. Uh, so my wife, uh, we 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 just had our third child about a month, a little over a month ago, and. Uh, when I hear about the the, the, the children and the family, I, I'm over here thinking to myself in the back of my mind, I'm like, are you giving her ideas that we're going for six now? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> as many as you can. As many as you can. <laughs> you know? No, but, uh, but I, enjoy them while they're little. That's what I was saying. That's awesome. Um, let me ask you this. I mean, if there is anything that, uh, that you would want to share with our audience that we may have missed or not asked, what would that be? Yeah, there's so many things. I mean, we can, we can go on for hours here. A lot of things. But one thing that actually, um, that John mentioned earlier that about the Googling your name, that, that's an amazing thing. Actually, you should do, everyone should do this, try to do this like once every quarter or once every month or something like that. Just Google your name, like see what comes up. Uh, because if you're going to do business with anyone, they're going to Google you. So you want to know. And so you want to make sure that like what's coming up is good. Hopefully, if you don't never had any problem with the law or anything like that, it should be all good stuff. But, um, <laughs> But the amazing thing about social media and podcasting specifically is that it actually 
you know, drives that that's what's going to show up. So if you want, you can be proactive about it and you can use social media and you can, you know, do podcasts and, and do these kind of things. And that just keeps your brand on point and will over and over the more you do it. I mean, it's just incredible. If you Google my name, like just cost irrigation, like kind of like hundreds and hundreds of, of podcasts and things like that. Well, you can't find anything else on me. If there was anything on me, right? It's buried. Like, you know, if it's, it's buried there on like page 20 of Google, right? So no one's going to find it. So, you know, just a, a little pro tip there. Uh, <laughs> Google your name to see what's out there and, and you can make a, you know, concerted effort to, to change that and get your brand more on point. Not that this is going to be challenging, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this uh, this with my final question, which would be, where would our audience be able to find you and connect with you and your firm? Snapchat is... No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, <laughs> the best way to find me... No, it is, it is... I don't even have an account. But uh, the best way, obviously, we talk about LinkedIn, Twitter. You can go to YonaWeiss.com. I'm really active on all the social channels, but... Please, if you do, just let me know you, you heard me on this podcast and uh, love to know. Just drop a, a quick note. It only takes about 10 seconds to write a little note uh, when you follow someone or connect with someone on social media instead of just hitting that follow button. No one knows who you are. Don't be anonymous. Make connections. Make those relationships. And, uh, and that's what we'll leave it. Love that. Man, well, I can't thank you enough for joining us today on Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate. I mean, it's been awesome getting to know a lot about you, but more importantly about the, uh, also as important, I would say, is the fact of cost segregation. I think that having a CPA as my partner and, and us here, well, we're all financial people. And quite frankly, it's something that we're in the dark about. <laughs> so, so I can't thank you enough for sharing that with us. And I, and I hope you have a blessed day. And, I, and again, thank you for uh, hopping on with us. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. It's a pleasure meeting you. All right. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us on the Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment to support us by subscribing and leaving a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And remember, the views and content shared on this podcast do not reflect that of Keystone Private Capital and Keystone Holdings. Creative Planning, LLC, Bergen KDV, Creative Planning, and Keystone Private Capital and Keystone Holdings are separate and distinct companies. Creative Planning is not affiliated with Keystone Private Capital, Keystone Holdings, or any of their affiliated companies and makes no claims, promises, or endorsements of any products offered by Keystone Private Capital and Keystone Holdings. Our views are our own and not those of creative planning. Thank you for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next episode.